it's come clear to me that human beings need things that make them happy. The things that we make make people happy. I didn't really realize at the time that my journey was going to be 30 plus years and where we are now. We still haven't got it right. We're, we're, every day is a way of improving. You know, you can't change the bigger picture. You work within it. That's what we do. I look forward to the next challenge. I grew up in Limuru, um, in the tea fields, and went to school in various Kenyan schools. Um, and yeah, I've started this business 30 something years ago. Well, I mean, as you know, school is very general, but when I, I did my degree in USIU and it was in International Business Administration, but at the same time we have a kind of uh, foundation in our family of an artistic background and so that of course informed my process assisting my mom in her studio when I left um, school and university and then eventually in the startup of my own business. The idea came about basically because we noticed a gap in the craft environment so the, the Kenyan craft environment had a lot of very talented hands making wood carvings, juakali metal, rubber um, shoes, bead work, clay work, and, 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 but no glass work. And so the entire uh, medium was missing. And my mom working in stained glass also needed flat glass for her process. And so I went on a course to see you know, what molten glass was all about, and, and because I had no idea that you could take an object and melt it. You know, our, our normal conception is that things break rather than melt. When I saw what the process was and what was involved with it, it was kind of magical, and it, it, it kind of hooked me at that point. And I saw also at that point that we could make a lot more than just the flat glass that was my our initial intent. And from there on, I didn't really look back. I mean, the, the, the process is incredibly meditative. It's, 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 a, it's a very kind of involved and focused discipline. It's very difficult to do and to learn. So, and, that, and, and then there's instant gratification. Even the, 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 the simplest, roughest lump that you make as an apprentice is still a beautiful piece of sparkling glass. And so there was that instant gratification from that. And, and I kind of really thought that this is something I need to explore a bit further. I didn't really realize at the time that my journey was going to be 30 plus years and where we are now, but hey ho. Kitengela hot glass isn't just a, an artisanal glass maker of tableware. To survive in the market and actually to create our market, we had to really be very plastic in what we made um, to be customer centric, to agree to try anything that people wanted because we needed need the turnover. Um, so our main kind of uh, uh, product lines are, yes, the prosaic tableware, glassware, jugs, vases, um, drinking glasses, tumblers and the, and the like. We also do lighting. So chandeliers, single lights, um, and all sorts of experimental lights. We do a technique called dalle de verre, which is um, kind of, it's a sort of stained glass. It's a method of casting glass slabs into concrete. Um, a very versatile discipline, um, very strong. So I also make furniture out of it, which is another of our product lines. Um, we make beads, of course, mostly for um, not for end products, but for people to then make things out of. Um, although we have a few end products. We, we have a homegrown discipline called funky fencing, which is something that we've invented. It's a kind of metal filigree with a glass infill. I do things like butterflies and dragonflies and stuff um, out of that, but it's mostly for kind of wall treatments or murals or logos or kind of abstract wall stuff. Um, and um, and what else, and sculpture and other sort of one-off pieces. The majority of the raw materials that we use are recycled glass, um, scrap glass from bottles and window glass. There's a burgeoning building industry in our developing country, so we uh, 
basically talk to glass suppliers and make use of their scrap. They would normally pay somebody to take it away and we pay them a nominal amount to take their clean scrap away. We also use bottles, but not as many as are available in the market. I get daily calls from people asking if I'll buy bottles and I, I'm a very small player in that. We're high visibility, but small usage of bottles I'll use. Major client at the moment is Procera. It's a Kenyan gin. So we are making bottles for them and they export everything currently. So that's a sort of de facto export. We started an online shop just pre-pandemic, which has been slowly growing. Um, and so that is kind of an export, um, mostly export actually, although there's, there's maybe 50% of that is, is the local market. Um, I have people who, have, who make collections and quite a lot of um, expatriates or NGO workers or three-year wonders who come out to Kenya to do their contract will then make a collection of our products and then export those back home. When we started, we, we pretty much started with nothing. We've grown, um, we haven't started with an injection of capital. I started, before I started, I looked for funding and grant money and loan money for nearly two and a half, three years. And most of the um, people that I spoke to said that this is not really a viable um, option or business plan or anything actually. So no, we can't help you or, or you know, basically don't do it. So I, I kind of ignored that um, because I wanted, as I said earlier, to, to inject this into the craft environment. Um, when, so when we started, I, I'd done very basic training in Holland. And so I knew the, the, the foundational kind of stuff that was required, but quite a lot of what's required in this job. It's very skill heavy and so you need years and years and years to get good at the job. But you have to start somewhere. So when we started, I with my small amount of knowledge and I had a couple of guys who were helping me build the building at, that we were in at the time uh, as Kibaruas and they were like, well can we you know, help? And it was, that was my talent pool at the time. So it was like basically whoever had the um, determination and uh, who wanted to dive in was what were my initial kind of employees so as we've grown and obviously diversified there's become more sort of specialist sections and skill sets that we've developed over the years but only from practicing for you know many many hundreds of hours and as it is my guys are far better than I ever was at blowing glass Actually, my plan is to get back to blowing glass. We are energy hungry. Um, melting glass takes um, thermal units. So whether you, you put those in with gas or oil or electricity or, or whatever, um, you have to put the power in somehow 24 hours a day. Um, we actually developed with the assistance of a Finnish friend of mine, a steam injected used oil system so we are NEMA accredited uh, used oil end users. The big idea is to, oh, the furnace was a standalone um, unit, so it generated its own steam, and then that atomized and inject the fuel, and that way we were essentially off grid. Of course, we have had and still have generators and kind of backup for all the other stuff that you need power for, lights and computers and the rest. And now that we've got a you know, metal workshop and the rest, we need slightly more power. So we were happy when KPLC came, although it is, as you know, KPLC is not the most reliable of um, suppliers. So I'm looking to perhaps try and put in some kind of a solar farm to mitigate that. Stages to make a piece, that's, that's kind of like how long is a piece of string. It depends if, if it's a standalone glass object, it can be 10 minutes if it's a simple object. It can be up to two days for a more complex one where you're prepping color and prepping styles of color, what we call cane or marini, and then uh, you basically relay those down and recollect them back up in patterns. So that 
uh, the actual making of such an object might take if you've prepped your color two to three hours. Um, larger pieces, so we do chandeliers or wall murals that have you know, 500, 1,000 or more pieces in them. Those can take months. When we started, um, we were a one-man show, myself, but very quickly, obviously, glass making is uh, it's, it's teamwork. So I needed assistance and people to learn with me the craft. Um, and we are now at 55 full-time employees. Every decision is a risk, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's so, all of them, I, I, I guess. Um, to from deciding that this was what we wanted to do to to every every process along the way. I mean, I I don't really look at life that way. I mean, it, I think it would be slightly um, anxiety-inducing to regard everything as a risk, which it kind of is, but um, I guess in a, in a broader sense, risk in starting a business that's a, a luxury product would be perhaps questionable in a developing country where we might be regarded as inessential. Although having said that, um, when COVID struck, I was ready to close down because you know, as a luxury product, it's like perhaps we won't be necessary at the end of times and when people are laying up dry goods and baked beans in bunkers. Um, but actually, as we've survived the pandemic, it's come clear to me that human, pe human beings need things that make them happy. And the things that we make make people happy. So they're shiny and colorful and pretty and they satisfy in the hand and they are they, they basically put a smile on your face when that light comes through a window in the morning. And that actually, I've reframed us as an essential service. If we can make people smile, then I think that's, that's really critical to um, you know, human well-being.